On this special episode of UBS Trending, my guest, Admiral Jonathan Greenert, former Chief of Naval Operations for the U.S. Navy, will discuss today's most pressing topics. We'll talk about the recent G7 summit, the looming U.S. debt ceiling, national cybersecurity, a whole lot more. We'll see where this conversation goes right now on UBS Trending. Hello, everyone, and welcome to UBS Trending. I'm Anthony Pastore. Thanks for being with me for this really special conversation that I'm excited to get into with Admiral Greenert. Admiral, great to have you here in the studio. Good to see you. Lots to get to today with you. Uh, thank you, Anthony. I look forward to it. Yeah, I mean, with your obviously with your military background, your experience in the White House, you're the perfect person to ask of all these questions that I have for you. But I think a lot of our, our viewers are maybe thinking a lot about the latest G7 summit that took place in Japan uh, recently, but particularly when it comes to the, I guess, the sanctions we can talk about with Russia and some of the China conversations. But I want to start with Russia, since the Ukraine-Russian conflict is still top of mind for so many of us. Yeah. What's some of the latest that you're hearing out of the G7 countries when it comes to Russia, the sanctions? that were, you know, that they're being placed on them. There already are sanctions, but they're announcing more. What are your thoughts on all of this? Well, the sanctions are a good idea, in my view. Uh, they have historically been good ideas, but they don't work right away. Mm -hmm. And I think there's this, uh, there's this narrative that say, well, yeah, we apply more sanctions, and this thing will be done in about a year, because they're all going to be broke. It doesn't work that way. That's kind of one. Two, oddly enough, Russia with China, with Iran, and to some degree, North Korea has worked an alternate economy, world, a global economy, right. participated by India in some respects, Brazil and others. And so the point is they're able to get some raw materials, some important uh, aspects for their economy. They're, they can keep going for a while, all right? right? They will degrade, they're truncated technologically, and it will cost them, just not right away. The significance of the conference, the G7 summit, I should say, is that once again, they all stacked hands, the G7, and these are the key players in this conflict supporting Ukraine. Just when we're wondering, hey, are we gonna wear out? Is Putin just gonna you know, double down? Uh, is the West gonna buckle? They stack hands and say, no, we're all in. And that's risk. They're all taking risk, and that's a good mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, there's, there seemed to be unanimous yes. support. Even President Zelensky showed up which there was some question about whether or not he would be able to go, but he was there in Japan on the ground Correct. with the rest of the G7 countries. That was a huge, uh, a massive show of support for, for Ukraine. Absolutely, and him being there, him reassuring, giving them, all right, this is where I'm going, mm -hmm. uh, look toward the counteroffensive. It's not a time thing, it's an event-driven thing. When I, the counteroffensive, I think everybody's familiar with. They said, well, I thought it was gonna be in the spring. It's almost June, we gotta mm. get going. And they say, no, 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 we have to do this right. I need your help. Uh, thank you for this. Thank you for the F-16 fighter planes. Thank you for the PAC-3 anti-missile system, which, by the way, works against a hypersonic missile. Who knew? A US-made product. This is all good. Things are starting to work. Uh, I don't wanna get, too optimistic, and I'm not saying, <laughs> hey, it's almost over, Anthony. Right. But what I'm trying to say is this is a strategically thinking uh, very good thing and not good for Putin in the long run. Right. And, you know, Admiral, you made a really good point. And somebody with your, as I said, your military background, you know that these things don't happen overnight. Obviously, right. we know U.S. sent over fighter jets and we sent support. D does that need to happen again? Have we done everything we could at this point without involving NATO as as we're always talking about, what, what else could be done here? Well, uh, continue to resupply the things that we've shown already work. Uh, more Pac-3 mm -hmm. missiles, that's the anti-ballistic missile and obviously hypersonic missile system. It works. Uh, more anti-aircraft uh, missile systems, there are many, I won't, too much alphabet <laughs> soup. I won't bore you with all that yeah, stuff. I find that stuff to be very uh, interesting, yeah. And in the grinding 155 millimeter artillery shells, uh, cruise missiles, uh, there are drones, uh, intel, ways to get them intel, cyber defense, cyber offense. As you've seen, they are edging toward offensive actions, they Ukraine, mm -hmm. in Russia. So these, all, these little iterations, keep doing them, 
but we have to, uh, and of course the artillery. Right. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, cavalry, the if cavalry. you will, tanks. Let's just make it, yeah. make it easy. Yeah, it's right. tanks. <laughs> and bring them all. Uh, lastly, I would say there's a, an important aspect. I think we're there, I'm told, you know, from my contacts, and that's who are these Ukrainians now leading? Because unfortunately, many of them in the early days, so successful, they were a well-trained army with well-trained leaders at the uh, unit level. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them died. So have we been able to replace with trained and capable, uh, competent folks? Uh, the answer we're getting is, well, yeah, the answer won't be no. Right. But I if that is true, and they're able to be as dynamically adjustable, if you will, adaptable in the battlefield, this bodes well. And that's good to hear. Obviously, the, the, the loss of life and the toll on human life is something that we could never really understand, and unless you're literally on the ground yeah. there. But uh, it's, it's good to hear your assessment of that, Admiral. Thank you. I want to just switch gears for a minute because right now, as we're sitting here in this studio, the debt ceiling debates are ongoing. We've heard from Speaker McCarthy. We've heard from President Biden. We've heard from other Republicans and Democrats on both sides. Sometimes it feels like they're getting closer to an agreement, and then other times it feels like they're drifting apart. Sure. Um, without going in, obviously, mm. this changes minute to minute, so I'm not going to sit here and ask you what's going to happen next. Yeah. Um, but the question is, if we don't get to some kind of agreement for the deadline, what's your biggest fear here? What could potentially happen if we don't get the debt ceiling agreed to? Well, if we don't, <clears throat> excuse me, the deadline of 1 June, that's not really a per se deadline. It's a minute and a half from now. It's, yeah, it's, somebody, it's something that somebody puts on and said, if we do... Everything, just like we're doing it now, spend, spend, spend on the budget that, mm -hmm. that was authorized and appropriated, uh, and we don't have a debt ceiling uh, lift uh, raised, uh, then we'll, we'll be in default in certain uh, elements, certain mechanisms. Well, guess what? There's a lot of opportunity to free spending here, uh, withhold obligations there, and pay the debts that would cause such a thing. So uh, if you can call that muddling, if you want, you can call it good judicious management mm -hmm. of fiscal resources, we could move our way well into the summer before any of these terrible, as they say, catastrophic things to the economy. Mm. But in the meantime, that means you're hold withholding funds on previously authorized and appropriated matters, such as defense, domestic, such as the Infrastructure Act, such as the IRS, you know. Uh, all of these sorts of things that, that we did, IRA, I guess, I'm sorry, uh, Bill, uh, th there's a price for all of this. But my point is the world's not going to come to an end economically or otherwise right. on 1 June. There are options. Uh, I think your question was, well, what if all those fail? That's right. Uh, I have a trouble getting there because we've never done that. That's exactly I mean, right. so many We can look at history, right? Yeah. yeah. I, d I don't think that'll happen. Uh, think of the political consequences. Why would any sitting president allow that to happen? Why would a brand new speaker who wants to make his mark say, well, that was a heck of a thing. You will be remembered. <laughs> you know? uh, Good okay. or bad, it's yeah, true. Yeah, so, and he'd probably lose his leadership. Yeah, chair. and on the top of that, you know, which something that when it hits the pockets of Americans, 66 million of them get Social Security benefits, which could be impacted as well if we don't come to an agreement. And right. that's, you know, when people yeah. go to the, the polls, whatever the election is, they think about their pockets, and that's usually the first thing they're thinking about. So right. you're right. It's in everybody's best interest to figure out how to make right. this work. Right. We were here, something similar to this, in 2011. I happened to be active duty. I just come in as... Chief of the Navy, we had a super committee, and they said, they'll never fail. In fact, I distinctly remember uh, the Secretary of Defense was Leon Panetta. Mm -hmm. And he told us all, these guys won't fail. It's too big to fail. How, how many times have you heard that? And we said, but Mr. Secretary, we, you know, collectively, the Comptroller of, the, of Defense said, we should uh, have a, some backup plan. He said, no, you won't need that. And we were wrong in that case. It's hard to predict. Uh, we got out of that eventually, as you know, and recovered. But after we were done, we had sequestration, if you recall that time. We, the budget was fundamentally reduced by 10% by taking a planer across all accounts. And in the end, we said, that was so damn dumb <laughs> to have that happen <laughs> with, without thought, not even an algorithm. We can't possibly do this again. Mm -hmm. All I'm trying to say, Anthony, is a lot of those people are still in the Congress and still in the federal government. I just don't believe it'll happen again. Yeah, hopefully their memories aren't that short. 
as you're saying. Uh, I mean, it wasn't that long ago, yeah. 12 years ago. Yeah. But that was a tough time. Many Americans who are watching this conversation right now can recall what that felt like. Yeah. But I, I do believe there'll be a little bit more poker playing yeah. going on. Or chicken, however you want to describe however it. However you want to describe it yeah. until the absolute deadline, which yeah. usually is the case. I think so. Admiral, yeah, that's, that's probably something none of us can be surpri are surprised to hear you say. Um, I also want to ask you, because I could ask you a million questions today, but one of the things that... I am, as an American, concerned about are the threats of cybersecurity, the threats of artificial intelligence. We're seeing these images of bombs looking like they're being exploded um, on the grounds of the Pentagon, <clears throat> which we found out quickly, thankfully, that it was fake. It was a deep yeah. fake, as they call it. But this is not going to be the first and only one that we'll see. These things could potentially hit us in the future. How big of a threat is cybersecurity is you know, nefarious artificial intelligence. Obviously, AI is great when it's helping us get work done or, you know, schoolwork or sure. you know, anything, yeah, but there's sure. a lot of bad actors out there. So uh, cybersecurity is a real threat, and yeah. it, it's one to be taken seriously. We are oh, eons ahead of where we were if you and I were having this conversation four years ago. Mm -hmm. We can generally, well, first of all, recall when President Biden took over, one of his very early meetings was with Xi Jinping, and with Putin, and he laid down the red lines. He did. And they agreed, cyber, that this gets into existential, here are the, what I guess, my definition, existential matters, don't go there. And so far, Russia and China have agreed to that. And that's good, you, you have to have a protocol for that. So let me set that aside, number one. Let me, let me give you a little bit more on that. Clearly, critical infrastructure was part of that, and that includes the financial system, medical system, and all these kinds of things that we say, whoa, my gosh, I'm very worried about it. I would set that aside. Mm. However, uh, there are a lot of other matters that you can get into. Where, you know, you put uh, Trojan horses and all the things that aren't happening right now but could happen later. That's a, clearly a threat. On the AI and on that video, there's a, a kind of an old saying in the military. The first report is probably wrong and at least inaccurate. And so people need to take a breath when things, and they say, well, Lucky, how can you say that? You know, the market moves like this. It we does. have algorithmic changes and say, that's all I can tell you. You have to verify this stuff. That's the world we're, leaving, we're living in and heading into. And AI will make it even more difficult because not only will it be sensational at first maybe, but it may be authentic and it may take us away. Uh, that's, I, as you know, many people that are even in that industry say we have to have a regulatory approach to be sure we can authenticate it and or preclude it. Yeah. And it's interesting because on the investment side, if you think about if we have to really ramp up our protection against cyber threats, there's a, there's a massive business there on the tech side, which our chief investment office here at UBS certainly believes is a place to be thinking about, especially when it comes to cyber and cybersecurity, and as things like ChatGPT and these other platforms become more and more popular and ubiquitous and human-like in their behaviors, right. it's something we really have to be conscientious of. Absolutely. Uh, again, it gets back to, uh, we, we don't even know what we don't know from. Right, that's right. How's that for brilliance? Yeah. <laughs> so the unknown unknowns are for those from the old days of the Iraq war. <laughs> so anyway, yes, uh, and again, uh, when, the, when the creators are saying, you ought to regulate this, this is a little extraordinary mm -hmm. because in the early days of Silicon Valley, the thoughts of regulation, they said, ah, you don't need that. It's all good, it's all for the good. Uh, so we, we got to get serious about that. Or yeah. We will pay a price that we really, really won't, would wish we, and we could have precluded. Absolutely. And I mean, we're talking about it on a, on a national, global scale. I mean, there are many men and women out there who have been scammed by, you know, cyber threats and given money, you know, out of their retirement savings. So it's, it's also on a, a small, granular, yeah. personal level as well that yeah. cyber is, is a massive threat. It yeah. may not be taking the nuclear codes, but it's taking, you know, almost took my grandmother's savings away because it tried to trick her into thinking she was giving right. money to one of my cousins. They, they, things like that that are really totally right. nefarious yeah. and just We're, evil. We've evolved into a new problem from the new, newer problem from the new problem. The new problem was they're going to take your, uh, in the military or in the Department of Defense, intelligence and information, mm. you know, and all the secrets. They're going to take it through cyber. Uh, secure uh, cyber breaches. Sure. Now we're we're going to convince you to take action on something you think is real. 
a newer problem than the one. How do you authenticate it? So that's the really the crawl in this. That's thing. right. I think that's the next wave of technology yeah. that yeah. needs to be, if it's not already out there, I'm sure somebody's working on it to identify right. when it's real and when it's not. Correct. Remember those little commercials, is it live or is it Memorex? <laughs> yeah. I'm dating myself <laughs> from the 80s. It's like that all over again. It's just in the digital form. <laughs> yeah, good point. Yeah. Good. Admiral. You are uh, a, a great uh, guest. Thank you for being here. It's, so, it's such an honor to sit here with you. I could ask you a thousand more questions. We'll have to do this again soon. Thank you, Anthony. Anytime you need pontification, I'm your guy. Excellent. And uh, <laughs> your, all, all your old w literal war stories and figurative <laughs> war stories, we'd love to hear more of that. Good to That's see right. you. That's right. Thank you, Anthony. Admiral Greener, thank you very much. And thank you all for sticking around with us. If you want any more information on anything we talked about today, especially when it comes to your investment portfolio, make sure to visit our insights page at UBS.com forward slash views. Plus, you can also follow us on all the social media channels, most notably our re newly relaunched UBS Trending Instagram channel. There's lots of great content up there, and we'll have some more content up there exclusively with Admiral Greener. So check that out when you have a moment. And don't forget, if you have any questions, make sure to talk to your financial advisor about your portfolio and your investment horizons. Until next time, I'm Anthony Pastore. Have a great day, everybody. Remember to keep your eyes on what's trending. We'll see you soon.